All right, so we're going to give everyone, because we do have uh, about, I think it was 30, almost 30 people that I saw registered. And mm -hmm. um, so I want to give a couple more minutes, give a couple more minutes. You know, they may have left to work Florida. in South Florida. Uh, sorry, Central Florida traffic is just so amazing. Always. That you never, ever, ever get stuck when you're going anywhere. <laughs> nice, nice euphemism of the word amazing there. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Hi, everyone. Hello, Maria. Hello. How are you doing? We are good and happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Nice to meet you, Alan. It's nice to meet you too, Maria. Thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited that you're here. We are gonna we have we are gonna give mm, a little bit of time. Give us about two more minutes, mm -hmm. and right. then we're gonna get this party started. And for those that are here, thank you for your timeliness. You're yes. earning, earning karmic points right now. Yes, you are, and we are recording this. So those that join a little bit later or that are probably stuck in traffic somewhere and said yeah. in our wonderful area, you know, they can catch it later. Yeah. All right, we are going to go ahead and get this started, uh, this party started. <laughs> uh, I've been talking a lot, so my words are sometimes not coming out right today. <laughs> All right, so welcome, everyone. We appreciate you being on time and being here with us. Uh, this is the ATD Central Florida uh, September 14th webinar with Align Hunkins, and we are going to talk about how to crack the leadership code. And I just want to go through a few chapter announcements with you. So uh, Align, uh, I'm sorry, is it Align or is it it's, Alan? It's, it's Alain. It's the French version. Uh, it's the Alain. French version. It's, yeah, Alain. It's, okay. Because I, I remember we met at the conference and we talked briefly and I was like, I think yeah. it's Alan, but yeah, you know, yeah, it could no be worries. No okay. Worries. So um, he'll be sharing uh, some tips with us today about how to help high achieving people become high achieving leaders. Uh, and I'll share more about that in a moment. But I did want to uh, just share with you uh, the, our current board. So some of these people, uh, beautiful people are on here with me today, uh, Scott Krause and Maria, and then the other beautiful people that make up our crazy crew that keeps bringing you uh, events like today's and other uh, exciting uh, opportunities to volunteer or become informed in what's going on in learning and development are shown on screen. If you're interested in volunteering with us, as you can see, we have plenty of opportunities for you to share your skills and learn some new skills. Uh, so feel free to contact us and, and, and let us know of your interest. Uh, if you are a power member, then yay for you. Best thing to do be is an ATD power member. If not, consider that because power membership is where it's at. You get all the benefits of being a local member as well as an ATD national member with all the great resources that they have to share for you. Um, and so uh, without further ado, we are going to uh, pass the ball over to Alan and uh he has over 25 years of experience uh, working with uh, over 2,000 groups of leaders in uh, over 27 countries, including 42 Fortune 100 companies. And in addition to being a leadership speaker, a consultant, trainer, coach, and a dad, he is the author of 
an amazing book called Cracking the Leadership Code, uh, Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. And this was published by Wiley in March of 2020. He is also a faculty member for Duke Corporate Education, and he serves on the Academic Board of Advisors for the New Delhi Institute of Management. And his work has been featured in Chief Executive, Fast Company, Training Magazine, Chief Learning Officer, and Business Insider. He often speaks at different conferences. Uh, that is uh, where we met at the Training Magazine Conference. And he's also a regular leadership strategy contributor to Forbes, father of two teenagers, and lives in Northampton, Massachusetts. Line, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and pass it to you so we can um, then uh, start learning how to crack the leadership code. Oh, thank you so much, Rosa. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate you being here. And for those that are watching the recording, good morning, good evening, good night, whatever time it is for you, welcome. Right. So thanks so much for joining us today. Yes, my name is Alain, and people sometimes like, is it like, like, like Rosa, is it Elaine? Is it Alain? Yeah. Is, it, is it Alien? Like, what's up with the name? <laughs> And that's like one of the most common names in the French language. So my mother grew up in Brussels, Belgium. Her first language is French. I have an older brother named Serge. It is super common there, which is great, I suppose, in a French-speaking country. Wasn't so easy growing up in Flushing, Queens, where I got called all sorts of names. But it is, in fact, in Latin. If you get it wrong, you wouldn't be the first or the last today. So it's really not a big deal. But I'm really excited to be here with you here because... The subject um, of the day is leadership, and it's something that I've really devoted my entire professional life to, both first of all, working with teams and leaders, and then researching and writing, which is what the book came out in 2020. And so what I'm really here to do today is to help you in a couple of areas around um, mindset of what does it mean to be an effective leader today, especially in the world that we're living in. I don't know if I can say post-pandemic, but getting hopefully towards post-pandemic, we're going to take a look at some of that, the mindset, as well as some simple tools that you can actually take away and use and even teach to the people that you work with as you move forward. So one of the ways that, you know, I, I know we have a lot of people in the talent development and in the learning space here. So one of the ways I wanted to make this engaging, you know, we have 90 minutes and the idea of me talking at you for 90 minutes not a really good idea. So what we're going to do is uh, to make things more interactive. I'm many of you are familiar with Mentimeter. So if you have access to a phone or a different browser on your computer, if you can please go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I will take you to the page. So go to menti.com. And when you get to menti.com, it's going to say, please put in a code and the code is 46609261. Again, that's 46609261. And when you show up there, either on your phone or on another browser, is a browser window, is there's going to be a question. Uh, what comes to mind when you think of the word leader? Because leadership means a lot of different things to different people. And would love you to put in the word. I think you can put in up to three words and go ahead and click share and or submit and then it will pop up magically on our screen. So what comes to mind when you think of the word leader? I'd love to get your thoughts on this one. Because I know we've had lots of people have said many things about this. And Maria, can you see my screen okay? Is that all working? I, I can see you pretty easily here. So is that all yes. working? Okay? Great. Yeah. I know it's just taking people. And we'll be using, and we'll be, and we'll, and, yeah, and we'll be using Mentimeter throughout here. Here comes some words. All right, so we've got words like authentic, trustworthy, communicator, mentor, motivator, guide, actions, um, collaborator, relationships. Interesting. Um, maybe I'm not surprised because we're working with people in the talent development space is that we have a lot of words that we'll kind of put in the soft skills category. Why am I not surprised given our current population of where we are? So that's great. I mean, the fact is leadership, and here's an interesting thing to think. If you think about your constituents within your organizations, if you ask them to come with, what would they think of when they think of leader? Do you think they'd come up with similar words or would they come up with some different words? Right? That's something else to consider. So something, you know, willing, mentor, right? We've got honest, authentic. Yeah, a lot of great things that we're going to get into today. So, and if you're, you're welcome to put in some more answers if you like. But as you do, I'm a big believer that one thing that great leaders do, and again, I've, everything I'm sharing today, I've learned from others throughout these last 25, 27 years, 
And one of the things I found that great leaders do is they make their implicit assumptions explicit. Because let's face it, people are good at a lot of things, but reading minds is definitely not one of them. So I want to share with you my purpose to be with you here today. And my purpose really is to help you to become a better leader. And that is really through looking at that mindset of what does it mean to lead today? And how is that different from maybe leading even three or five and certainly 10 years ago? And then also, what does it mean and how do I translate that into what I do? So I guess a good question to start with would be, what makes the world's most successful leader successful? I mean, in some ways that is the question of the day, right? And I actually got my first big hint, literally handed to me in a gift bag over 25 years ago. So I was having lunch at a little diner on the west side of Manhattan called the Empire Diner with my mentor named Jeff. And Jeff and I used to meet for lunch every month or so, and we would talk shop about leadership and life. And on this particular day, as we're finishing up, it's a very cold, unseasonably cold October day. It was almost like winter weather. And we're finishing up these bowls of soup. And Jeff hands me this gift bag and he says, hey, Alain, here, here, congratulations on last weekend. Well, you see, the weekend before, I just gotten certified to lead a very complex training that I had spent years preparing for. So I said, thanks, Jeff. That's really sweet. Go ahead and open it up. So I open up the bag and inside the bag, I'll show it to you. It's right here is this very large, actually it's technically an extra large t-shirt. And what does it say? Yes, leader, leader. And I said, thanks Jeff, that's really sweet of you. You know, Jeff was like a father figure to me. So this was a really sweet moment in this. And so Jeff happens to have this completely bald head, which is now shining brightly in the fluorescent light. And he gets this impish grin on his face. He says, oh, Alain, turn the shirt around, turn the shirt around. Let me show you what's on the back. I'll, I'll never forget what Jeff said next. He said, Alain, welcome to leadership. You see, as a leader, you're always a target. Now, if you're a great leader, you'll be the target of people's hopes, their dreams, their aspirations, or even their envy. But if you are a lousy leader, you'll be the target of people's disappointment, their criticism, and their blame. Now, as a leader, you cannot not be a target. You always wear this target on your back. Now, what type of target? That is for you to figure out. And what makes it so challenging is you're a different single target to every single person that you work with. And it turns out that Jeff's words have actually been borne out in the research. Turns out that people don't necessarily think their leaders are leading as well as the leaders do. Now, here's a little poll for you. If you can go back to Mentimeter, again, same code 46609261 should pop up if you still have it open. So what percentage of people believe their leader leads well? What do you think? So we've got one person is saying 23%, one person, two people are saying 23. I've got more people are saying 23. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So we've got four responses to that. So I don't know how you all, okay, 34% is another choice. Okay. So it turns out in the research, uh, and I found this from Ketchum Communications and did a lot of research, and this was a good ballpark in the middle of the bell curve, turns out that 23% of people believe their leaders lead well. Now, it's funny, when I share this statistic with people, it's like, don't leaders realize? Like, that's like, no, of course leaders don't realize that they don't lead well. Because let's face it, in most organizations, going to your boss and saying, excuse me, you're not very effective, might be a career limiting move. And so, of course, we are blind to our own blindness when we're in that role. We don't recognize that, yeah, we wake up, no one wakes up and thinks, I want to be a crummy leader and a lousy communicator and a bad connector. And yet the net result is that that's exactly what's going on in a lot of places. So let me ask you all, I'd love you, you could answer some, you can actually fill in some text to this one. Why do you think leading well, particularly now, is so challenging? Love to get some responses to this one. Um, I know this is a bit of a deep question for 6.45 in the evening, but heck, I think we can handle it. So why do you think leading well now is particularly so challenging? What are your thoughts? And you can write more than a word here. So see what you think. Why is leading well now so challenging? Because clearly only 23% of people are really doing it well. What are your thoughts on this one? Mm, that's a really good one. So for those that are watching, and I'll just keep reading through and commenting on some of these things. Yeah, time and responsibility constraints. So interesting. This is the response that I get from so many leaders. Like, I just don't have time. 
I just don't have the time to focus on my people because I've got so many other things to do. You have too many changes used to having done what they've always done, right? So it's that sense of the old patterns, the legacy patterns of how we've done stuff. Yeah, and the workforce has definitely changed. Hybrid environments, people's personal needs. Yeah, we're going to get into that in just a moment. So lots of things have changed. This is great. Lack of commitment, direction, lack of clear vision, uh, detail-oriented, on service. Are we focusing on this? Yeah, real word. Is, yeah, people are tired. <laughs> Amen. I hear you. People are. And it's also distraction. I mean, thinking about what we've come through in the last couple of years, it has really shifted things. In fact, we have gone through an age of extreme accelerated disruption. And we're going to cover that in just a little while. So yeah, lots of good reasons as to leading well, particularly now, is more challenging than ever, which means that leaders need to be more skilled than ever to deal with what we'll call the current reality. Notice I didn't call it the new normal because I don't think there is such a thing as the new normal. But really, one of the challenges that lies at the heart of this, you know, and I think the first piece is that leaders have to be aware of, I've got room to improve. And the reason that so many leaders don't do that is because they suffer from what many call the fundamental attribution error, which is a fancy way for saying that we judge ourselves by our intentions. In other words, I think I'm a good leader. I mean well, I hope to do a good job. But the fact is we judge others by their actions and people are judging leaders by their actions. Goes back to that target on the back of the t-shirt. So why is leading well so challenging now? There's a wonderful quote, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It comes from Alvin Toffler, who is a futurist. And he wrote these words in 1980, which I think was incredibly prophetic. And maybe you're familiar with this quote. It's, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn unlearn and relearn. And the fact is yeah. when, it, when it comes to leadership, there is a lot of, as much as learning there is to do, I think there is equally as much unlearning to do. Yeah. And, we're, and, we're gonna, and we're gonna take a look at how that plays out here today because there's a lot of unlearning. Um, so as you know, we are in, some people are calling it the great reset. Some people are calling it the great reshuffle. Some is calling it the great resignation, whatever you wanna call it. Let's look at a few of the factors that are in place around all this. One is the fact that, let's face it, traditional power and authority is not working. Because I said so, just doesn't cut it. I mean, if it ever did, it, which it might have done maybe 100 years ago, but it really hasn't cut it since then. So the fact is, we can't lean on the traditional authority power structures that used to work as well as they did. Next thing is, as I said, we are in this age of accelerated disruption. The fact is, the disruptions that we see going on right now, the seeds have been planted before the pandemic. But the fact is the pandemic just rocked everyone's world in terms of how that was playing out. Then because of all that, and you can look at the fact that we've had mental health issues with burnout, the fact that we had shifts in the economy, the pandemic, massive upheaval and in social injustice, there has been a fundamental shift in workers' mentalities and not just about work, but about life. I mean, and don't ask, I mean, just ask yourself, didn't you over the course of these couple of last years, press pause and go, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? And asking some of these bigger, deeper questions that go on. And that is a big, big shift from the way that people were just going and going and going. And also because of that, employees are now rewriting a new social contract. And they're questioning, wait, we managed to shift things pretty quickly. Now you're saying, for example, I have to go back to the office. Why? Why? Why should I do that? It doesn't make any, in, in some cases, that's just one example of the new social contract. And because of the social contract, what we're seeing across the board is that employees are demanding more from their employers than ever before. And not just from that the employer, as in the organization, they are demanding more and more for their leaders. So when you look at all of these structures in play at once, what is the net result? Well, you know what the net result is, retention issues, big time. So this came from McKinsey. This was just in July, not long ago. 40% of employees are considering quitting their jobs in the next three to six months. Now, as you kind of dive deeper into this research, what they found was there were top four reasons as to why employees say would they quit their jobs. Number one, lack of career development and advancement. Number two, inadequate total compensation. Number three, uncaring and inspiring leaders. And four, lack of meaningful work. Now, what's interesting to me about these four reasons is the fact that leadership impacts every single one of them. 
you know, you may be familiar with Gallup has did some studies a few years ago. And what they found was that 70% of the difference between lousy, good, and great team culture is directly due in, to that team's immediate, immediate leader. So I like to say that leaders don't just make a difference. Leaders are the difference. And so again, there are a lot of reasons why it would benefit all of us to become better leaders. So thinking about how we got here and looking at this great reset and looking at the fact that only 23% of people think their leaders lead well, here's a useful question. How did we get here? Right? Almost quoting the talking heads. How did we get here? So how do we get here? Well, that's what fascinated me because I also love history. And I find that, and there's a number of different quotes. One of my favorites comes from Carlos Castaneda that said that people who do not learn from the past are destined to repeat it. So I did some digging and some research around the history of organized leadership in organizations. And wherever I went, all roads led to this guy. I don't know if you know who this is. This is Frederick Winslow Taylor, who is considered by many to be the father of the field of management and organized leadership in organizations. Now, you need to know a few things about Taylor. Taylor, by training, was a mechanical engineer, and he lived... Right at the dawn of the 20th century, so late 1800s, early 1900s. And so as a mechanical engineer in the industrial age, he saw the workplace as a mechanistic, mechanical problem to be solved. Have you ever stopped to think where the words human resources were ever invented? Thank you, Frederick Winslow Taylor, because he saw human beings as parts of an overall machine, spare parts, resources that could be plugged in and plugged out over time. Now, Taylor had immense sway over people, partially through his speaking, but also through his writing. So he wrote a book called Principles of Scientific Leadership, which was published in 1915, which went on to be considered the most influential leadership book of the entire 20th century, where he put this huge premium on the idea of being more efficient. Now, what's interesting in Taylor's mechanistic worldview of efficiency, this is how he described leaders. I, I should say, this is how we describe employees. And I'm actually going to show you a quote from the book. I saw this the first time my jaw hit the ground. If I can just read how he described the ideal workman shall be so stupid and phlegmatic that he more nearly resembles in his mental makeup the ox than any other type. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that and I think, wow, that's not exactly a form of respect that I seen as an ox. And so here's the thing, Taylor's ideas spread like wildfire. He became the forerunner of the Industrial Revolution. And one of his big disciples was Henry Ford. Now, Henry Ford, obviously the founder of the Ford Motor Company, where they brought in the assembly line to the automotive industry and did all sorts of things. Now, what's interesting about Henry Ford, here are some of Henry Ford's ideas around people at work. Ford famously said, why is it every time that I want a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached. So Ford and Taylor's ideas, of, we call this Taylorism, continued to spread. Turns out that Taylorism was adopted by a little startup school that had just started a little business school. Maybe you've heard of it, Harvard Business School. Turns out that principles of scientific leadership became the management playbook for the 20th century. So what is this playbook about? It is about command and control. It is about efficiency and seeing people as just a cog in the machine. Now, of course, this works fine if what you're building are Model Ts where you're not changing the assembly line for literally 23 years and it's the same job every single day. It worked to a point. You could get away with command and control. You could expect obedience and compliance. But as you and I both know, the world has drastically shifted since the days of Frederick Winslow Taylor and Henry Ford. And so this idea that I think so many leaders are stuck with is that we have inherited a legacy of industrial age thinking that has continued into the knowledge work age. Now, we talked earlier about the fundamental attribution error, right? That the idea that People judge ourselves by our intentions, but we're judged by others by our actions. Well, I think there is a corollary to the fundamental attribution error, and I call it the fundamental leadership error. And whenever I tell people about this, I see head nod like this. And here's the error. I'm sure you're familiar with it. In so many organizations, who gets promoted? And you're like, hey, Maria, you're really good at this. Let's say you're in sales. You're a really good salesperson. We're going to make you head of the sales team. You're going to start leading. 
And of course, Maria, being a great salesperson, continues to do what she did to try to lead people. But the big fundamental leadership error here is the fact that there is a huge, huge difference between being a high performer, someone who's got the skills of an individual contributor. That is one set of skills, but it is not the same as facilitating high performance in others. And you don't close that gap by just working harder. And I see so many leaders, you know, we said earlier, why is leading so hard? People are burned out, they're tired. If we keep trying to use this industrial age mindset in what is not an industrial age problem, we are destined to struggle, which is why I think so many leaders are struggling. So the fact is, if you want to be able to facilitate high performance in others, you need what I call the facilitative mindset. It's a whole set of beliefs and behaviors that make achieving performance goals for yourself and for others easier. And to bring this facilitative mindset to life, I want to tell you a story about a guy I met named Matt. Now, Matt worked for a national retail franchise. They had franchisees all over the United States. And Matt, when I met him, was a district manager. Now, the company was divided up. They had 100 different districts all around the country. He was one of the 100 district managers, and they ranked them by performance. And when I met Matt, Matt was ranked the number one top-ranked district manager out of all 100. I said, Matt, that is very impressive. Have you always been such a star, high-performing leader? He said, no, no, no. When I started, gosh, I was like 84th and 83rd for like five years. So I knew there's got to be a story. I said, oh, Matt, tell me what changed. How did you change from going to be 84 to number one? So Matt had been a manager of one of their stores. And then he got promoted to being a district manager. He said, when I got promoted, I thought my job was to be the fixer. You see, every morning, he'd say, every morning they would print out what they called the hot list. It was, a, it was a basically a measurement of all their key performance indicators in their stores. So he said, the first thing I'd do is I'd look at the hot list and I'd see what was in red and not measuring up and I'd circle that. And then I'd hop in my car and I would drive from store to store and I'd tell the store manager, this is in red, you gotta fix this. You gotta fix this. This is wrong, you gotta do this. And he would hustle from store to store. And he was working like that, just telling people what they need to do and trying to fix them. And he said he did that for years and he worked so hard and he struggled and he went nowhere. He said the worst day was the day he realized there were plenty of people on the various store teams who were quitting and he never even knew what their names were. And he thought, I've got to change my approach. So he reached out to some other people and he asked for some mentoring. And so what he did is he changed his approach. So this is what he started to do instead. He'd still print out the hot list. He'd still drive and meet with the store managers. The first thing he'd do is come in and he'd say, hey, Alicia, how are you? How was your weekend? How's your family? What's going on? And he'd start to build a real relationship, connect with people outside of work. And then he had the hot list, but instead of circling it in red and saying, this is wrong, you need to fix this. He'd say, here's the data. What do you think we should do? And then together, they would co-create solutions together. And Matt said, when he started doing that, his numbers and his performance started going from the 80s to the 70s to the 60s, all the way up to the top five and then to the number one. And he said what he finally realized was the key to hitting the numbers was to stop focusing on the numbers first. In fact, the key was to start focusing on the people because it was the people that were hitting the numbers. Now, look, you're all a group of talent development professionals. I don't have to remind you that I don't care what industry you're in, whether it's high tech or pharmaceuticals or manufacturing or telecommunications. First and foremost, we are all in the people business. And so when I think back to what did Matt demonstrate in his story, and it's something that I've seen time and time again. In fact, it is the basis of what I wrote my book on, Cracking the Leadership Code. The subtitle is The Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. And what Matt revealed in his story were these three secrets to becoming a better leader. And they are connection, communication, and collaboration. So where did he start? He started by connecting with other human beings, building real, genuine, human-to-human -human relationships. That was the first piece. Second piece was around communicating and seeking to communicate, leading by listening and seeking first to understand what was going on. And then together, once they had the basis of connection and communication, then they could work together to collaborate. And so what I'm going to offer to us today is to take just kind of a high level overview of these three C's of connection, communication, and collaboration, and also teach you a simple tool that hopefully will help you to become ultimately a better connector, a better communicator, and ultimately a better 
leader and collaborator. So we'll start with connection. And I'm just curious, have you ever had to work with a jerk in your life? You don't have to raise your hand if they're here. No, no. Um, so I want to tell you a story about someone who self-identified as a recovering jerk and actually how the key to his recovery was, in fact, the key to connection. So for the purpose of the story, we'll call this guy Glenn. That also happens to be his name. So I met Glenn and 15 of his colleagues in a training session that I was leading for their company. We were out uh, on the North Shore of Long Island, and the subject we were discussing was the subject of beliefs, and specifically how beliefs, when we feel them or believe something, they feel absolutely rock-solid certain. But I was trying to point out the fact that beliefs over time are actually flexible and fluid and can change. So to illustrate the point, I asked the group a question that I asked dozens of groups before. In fact, I'm going to ask you to answer the same exact question. If you want to put your answers into the chat, that would be great. And you can see by the way I set up this question, um, it's it's you're being set up. Just hint, hint, nudge, nudge, you know where we're going to go. Okay, so this is what I said to the group. I said, all right, but beliefs over time can change. So to illustrate this, here's a question for all of you. And again, put your answer in the chat. Can you think of something that you once believed at some point in your life, maybe a long time ago, like when you were a kid, that you really believed and believed that you no longer believe? So that's the question. What would you answer to that question if I answer you that? Go ahead and put your answers in chat right now. Let's see what you have to say. What do we got? What would you say if some, something you once believed a long time ago when you were a kid that you no longer believe? Go ahead and put your answers in the chat. Oh, no. Have you really spoiled it for all of us, Rosa? You just put Santa Claus. Yes, exactly. That is the number one answer that I get. I get about 90% are Santa Claus. Close second and third, I have to say, are the Tooth Fairy. And yes, there it is, the Easter Bunny. Thank you. But Santa is, in fact, so common. Look, see, you set me up. I knew this was coming. We got the next slide. It's got Santa Claus right there. Who knew? There you go. So Santa Claus. So that's what I'm expecting to hear. I'm hearing Santa or maybe the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy. Either way, I can work with any of these things. But however, on this particular day, Glenn decided to take my question in a whole different direction. This is what Glenn, he raises his hand and said, yeah, something I once believed that I no longer believe. Yeah, that's an easy one. I never really liked people a whole lot. <laughs> wait, wait, where is this guy going? What is he talking about? He said, yeah, I mean, and at work, I was a total jerk. Honestly, I was an SOB. And the fact is, all I cared about is that my people hit their numbers. I mean, I thought my job as their boss was to tell them what to do. And frankly, their job is to shut up and do it. Now, at this point, he has completely hijacked my day. You know, if anyone's ever led trainings, you know, here's the renegade rogue who's just taken command of my day. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do now? But at that very moment, Glenn shifted. This is what he said. He said, yeah, but all that changed two years ago. You see, um, my wife was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer and um, people just started showing up out of the woodwork and helping I mean, doing pickups and drop-offs at school for the kids and making meals bringing them over it completely restored my faith in humanity and people at work I realized that well they had families too and they had challenges too so I started asking them about their lives outside of work maybe maybe for the first time ever I'd like to think I'm not the same jerk I used to be but honestly you'd have to ask my team about that so as Glenn finished his story, I just was like, are those my eyes that are crying? Because <laughs> like, I just noticed all of us in the room were either weeping or about to get pretty sobby there. It was a very powerful moment because he was being so vulnerable and open in this moment. And as I reflect on Glenn and I reflect on his story and I think about what is it that changed in him, the word that comes to mind is empathy. It's first receiving it from others and then learning how to give it to others. Now, what's interesting about empathy, it's best defined as really showing people that you understand them and care how they feel. Now, on the surface level, that sounds like the most basic human thing to do. And the fact is, it is basic and human. The fact is, we all can demonstrate empathy, and we all do demonstrate empathy. But the challenge is that we don't demonstrate empathy with everyone. Turns out, each of us have our own circle of empathy. So loved ones, family great friends. They make the cut. They're in the circle. But the further we get away from those people, the more distance, the less likely we are to actually be empathic. Well, throw work into the mix where people have pressures and timelines and deadlines and stresses. Empathy can be in short supply. And just as an example of this, there was a recent study by Business Solver. They asked a group of CEOs and employees in the same organizations as those CEOs. They said, is your organization empathetic? 
Well, it turns out that 92% of the CEOs said, yes, of course, empathy is a core value attribute in our company. Yes, we are empathetic. We are an empathetic organization, said the CEOs. Well, they went to the employees and they said, so employees, are your CEOs empathetic? Guess what? There's that gap again. Only 50% of employees said that their CEOs were, em were empathetic. So what that tells me is there is a gap that even though people may intend to want to lead with empathy, leading with empathy is easier said than done. Question is why? So let me ask you, what do you see as the biggest barriers to leading with empathy? You want to go ahead and put your answers into the survey? That would be great. What do you see as the biggest barriers to leading with empathy? Again, if empathy is divine, defined as showing people you understand them and care how they feel, easier said than done sometimes. So what do you think, particularly in an organization, what are the biggest barriers to leading with empathy? Okay, so here comes some words. Emotional intelligence, compassion, listening. I'm curious to hear what other people have to say. Interesting around compassion. Um, I'm curious, whoever wrote compassion, can you come off mute and talk to us a little bit about why you chose the word compassion? In what way? So I, I put that. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Rosie. So, you know, it's really about, you know, yeah, empathy, putting yourself in, in, you know, the other shoes, but yeah. sometimes uh, their experiences are, you know, something that you can't even fathom at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're not always going to be able to put yourself in the, in the other person's shoes but you can at least try to you know uh have some compassion for them uh and and try to somehow understand what they're going through uh in a situation or why they have a particular opinion or thought uh as as a leader or you know even peer uh with the person mm -hmm. uh to then you know try to coexist in the workplace in a you know in a in a way that uh, is not where it's toxic and people feel yeah. like they don't want to be there, you know, that thing. Yeah, no, for sure. That makes total sense. Thank you. Thanks for that, Rosa. And, 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 and I put emotional intelligence as the, the last one, because really it comes down to that is really, you know, uh, so, uh, exercising that muscle. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is the barrier is the lack of emotional intelligence, particularly. You, yeah, right, yeah, for sure. And Alicia, I noticed uh, you put in not knowing your team. Could you speak some more about that one? If you can come off mute and illuminate us on your thoughts on not how not knowing your team. Uh, it goes back to what you were saying initially, uh, connecting with them. So yeah. if I know my team and I've connected with them, I know when Scott is not feeling good. So I'm going to have a conversation. Scott, Great. let's talk. How are you doing today? Is there anything I can do for you? Um, so just knowing your team uh, and knowing when you know, they, they are really excited about something or not excited. So it goes both ways. So just knowing your team. That's great. Thanks, Alicia. And as you say that, what comes up, again, it makes me think back to what Rose was talking about around emotional intelligence, to know your team and notice things like, Scott, you have to be able to pick up on some subtle cues right now. Now, again, if you're skilled in this, the cues are not so subtle. But if you're not very skilled at this, it's like, whoa, I, I, I need a two by four to hit me over the head. Like, Scott, are you okay? Like, I didn't realize something was wrong. And so it's learning how to tune in to the human factor of this. And yeah, we also have things like listening and lack of experience. So what I found in my research, and uh, there's a whole chapter on empathy being the super connecting strength of leaders in the book. Um, one of the things I found, uh, a couple of things is the research was the number one reason. Again, if you think that empathy is defined as showing people that you understand them and care how they feel, the number one thing that gets in the way, people say, is time, right? Because let's face it, we live in this digital age. And I don't know about you, but most people I talk to, they're getting 100, 200 emails a day. And they're just so busy, busy, busy. This came back to somebody said this earlier. You know, what makes leading today so challenging? Just the pace, the workload. It's time, this sense of what is going on in terms of that. And the fact is, the challenge is that so many of our organizations are you know, we're in this drive, drive, drive for results. I mean, many of you may have organizations where bias for action or drive for results is a core competency. And now, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not against results at all. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, we want to get results. However, part of leadership wisdom is recognizing 
that driving for results should not come at the expense of driving over the people who are trying to deliver those results. So part of that means we have to have the wisdom to know there's a time and a place to go fast and there is a time and a place to go slow. And one of the things that the research is finding, particularly today, you know, in the midst of here we are two some odd years into this pandemic and just people's needs to feel connected and also the desire for people to be seen as a whole person is just, can you connect with me on me as a person as opposed to me in my employee org chart box? And like, how's the task going? How's the project going? Like people wanna know, how are you? How are you feeling? Now I realize that feeling valued and cared for might sound like the softest and fuzziest of all metrics, but the research today is pretty, pretty substantial that shows that the number one thing that improves employee engagement and performance is feeling valued and cared for by your immediate supervisor. So there's lots of research and the book goes, I've got 30 pages of footnotes that go into some of this stuff in the book. So time is a big factor. And we say, we don't have time. And it was interesting. I was just interviewing a, a leader last month for an upcoming Forbes article who leads a team of 550 people. And he literally has everyone's names, 550 people. Now, obviously they don't all report to him directly, but he has everyone's names and cell phones on some kind of a document that he can get to. And he said, when I have five minutes, I just call or text somebody and say, hey, what's going on? How are you? And I said, how do you have time for that? You know, because what I keep hearing is from people who have five or 10 report, direct reports, they don't have time. They just don't have time. And he said, look, last time I checked, everybody gets 168 hours a week. It's a question of where do you spend your time? I don't see it as a waste of time. This is an investment. The fact is the only reason I get what I get done is because all these people are doing this work. My job is to support them. And there was something about his tone that was just so incredulous of how can you say you don't have time? This is the job of the leader is to invest. And it's so interesting because we know we talk about employee engagement kind of being the holy grail of all of, you know, how many metrics come out of employee engagement. For my take is you don't have employee engagement without leadership engagement, right? If leaders don't engage with their employees, you're not going to have employee engagement. And if you take that one step further and think about where do we use the word engagement outside of a work or employee engagement context, it's in marriage, right? When it's like, oh, we're engaged. And when you are engaging someone to marry you, what are you really saying? You're saying, will you please spend a lot of time with me? In other words, the rest of your life with me. So there is this sense of empathy, showing people that you want to connect and care about them, understand how they feel. That does take time. And you have to be wise about where and when you spend that time. So that's the number one reason as to why people, um, why people um, don't show empathy. The number two reason is the fact is human beings and our emotions are messy, right? The fact is in the business world, we love numbers. And why do we love numbers? Because they're neat and tidy and clean and crisp and they're consistent. The fact is, if you show up to a meeting next week, and the number six walks in the door, it is always one more than five and one less than seven. You never have to worry about six being anything other than six. But, you know, if Scott comes into a meeting next week, who knows which version of Scott's going to show up, right? Is it going to be the enthusiastic Scott, the withdrawn Scott, the uh, lots on my plate Scott, the customer had a bad day Scott, right? This is the nature of what we have to deal with. It's funny, I was working with a guy who was a partner at a consulting firm and he said, honestly, you know what? I never ask my people how they feel. And you want to know why I never ask them? Because if I ask them, you know what's going to happen? They're going to tell me. And I don't think I want all that information, right? So it's interesting because this leader, and I think many of us are familiar, and maybe I'm certainly old enough to remember these days where there was the, we have a check your feelings at the door policy. We don't talk about feelings. We don't do that at work. And again, that is inherited industrial age leadership legacy. Stop and think about that for a second. We check our feelings at the door. You can't check your feelings at the door. What do you do? You suppress your feelings at the door. You still have them. What you end up doing is you cover your identity. You wear a mask. In other words, you don't feel safe being fully yourself at work. And if that's true for you, you are in the majority. So Deloitte did this study a couple of years ago and found that 61% of employees in the US cover their identities in some ways. That is, they put on some kind of a shield because they don't feel safe being fully themselves. And as you and I both know, when you put on that shield, that creates a disconnect, which creates a low trust, low connection, and ultimately a lower performance culture. So now that we looked at a couple of the biggest barriers to leading with empathy, I wanna offer you what I have found through the research to be the number one thing that is the fast track 
to building empathy and connection. And I call it listening with purpose, which is very different, by the way, of just listening to come to a conclusion or get to an answer. So listening with purpose is very intentional. And I learned a lot about listening with purpose when I first got into this world of consulting over 25 years ago. So when I first got into consulting, I had done some educational training, but I had never worked in the business world. And suddenly, very quickly on, I was being asked to consult with executives, directors, VPs, EVPs, even CEOs. And frankly, I was a bit nervous. I was very young and green in my career, and I didn't know what I was going to do exactly. I had this wonderful mentor named Sue, and Sue said, Alain, don't worry about being this know-it-all, like you have to know everything about your business. Instead of being a know-it-all, focus on being a learn-it-all. The fact is, these leaders will tell you everything and more than you need to know. But what you need to do is be curious and ask great questions, and then listen listen, listen with purpose. So what Sue did is she helped to create a fairly boilerplate standard list of questions that I could use in just about any situation that involved leadership and management consulting. So some of the questions will sound very familiar to many of you. Things like, all right, can you please tell me what's the biggest challenge that your team is facing? And then I'd listen, they'd say something, and I'd say, great, can you tell me more about that? And I'd probe and ask them more questions. I'd ask questions like, if we could wave a magic wand, what is one thing you'd want to change as, as a result of this training? And so kind of making them distill things down. So I started asking these sort of fairly standard questions. And what I found was not only would I get great information from the clients, but because I was so intentive and curious and looking to learn it all and, and ask more questions and listen with purpose, they not only shared information, but they opened up to me and we developed some very strong relationships, some relationships that I still have to this day. You know, it's funny. I remember working with this one woman. Her name was Marlene and Marlene and I were finishing up one of these calls and I was using, I used one of my stock questions. I said, so Marlene, before we finish, is there anything that I haven't asked you that I ought to have asked you? Again, that's probably a question that many of you have asked on a consulting call. And she said, no, 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 no. This has been great. Uh, she, first, she said, that's a great question. I thought, yeah, thank you, Sue. Thank you for the question because I didn't invent it. I said, great. She said, thanks. She said, no, this has been a great call, Alain. Thank you. But I have to say, you know, I feel lighter, almost like this was a good therapy session or something. So going back to the idea that human beings are messy, the fact is you don't need to be a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist or therapist to take an interest and listen to the purpose. All you need to do is be a curious interested, empathic human being who wants to see things from someone else's perspective. And when you do that, it is a fast, fast track to connection. So I'm going to invite you to just take a moment on your own. If you have a piece of paper and a pen and just think about this tool, listening with purpose. Maybe it's new to you. Maybe it's something that's new words for an old concept for yourself. But I just invite you to think, what is one relationship that would benefit from you being more intentional around listening with purpose. I'm just invite you to, to, to kind of capture that for yourself, this little introvert moment of reflection for you. What is one relationship that would benefit from you being more intentional, listening with purpose? Just one. And you might want to think about who that is and what that might actually look like. And then beyond that one relationship, I'm going to open it up with a poll here. If you think about within your organization, which set or sets of relationships would benefit if you apply listening with purpose more intentionally? And you can pick as many of these as you like. So again, using Mentimeter here, menti.com 46609261, which set of relationships would benefit? Oh, so I just got all of them. Yeah, for sure, right? Absolutely. I know that's a bit of a gimme question, but just think about that. I mean, fact is you're dealing with all these different people all the time, all the time. And so here we go. Okay. A lot of people. Yep. Okay. So super good to notice in terms of that. And I'll just give it another moment. If anybody else wants to put any more answers into the poll, I know that some people are probably not on. It's a lot of things to be on Zoom. And if you're on Zoom on your phone, good luck. It's all you're already, you're already occupied with that. So yeah. So just take a look at that. Okay, well, thank you. So we've looked at connection and how empathy and listening with purpose is a wonderful fast track tool to build more connection. It's showing how that plays out. So excellent, thanks. So now we're gonna turn our attention to our next C, our next principle, which is around communication. And as you and I both know, communication is so much easier in theory than in practice. 
And one of my all-time favorite quotes, I know it's an oldie, but a goodie, but my favorite quote from George Bernard Shaw, you probably know this one, right? The single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And the fact is, it turns out that confusion is actually way more common than clarity than you might think. Here's a little research for you from HR Magazine in the UK. It turns out that 46% of employees regularly receive confusing instructions. In fact, they are so confused, the same 46% report wasting an average of 40 minutes per day trying to figure out what the heck they are supposed to do. So yeah, if confusion rather than clarity is the norm, here's a question for you. Why? Why is effective, like communication is not challenging, effective communication is definitely challenging. So what are your thoughts if you can answer in this Menti poll? Why is effective communication so challenging? What are your thoughts on this one? Because it certainly is. And there's a whole bunch of other studies I could share. Again, in the book, I go into the fact that um, 96% of executives think that lack of communication or ineffective communication is the number one reason of workplace failures. Yeah, so here we go. Each person heard through a filter. Oh, biases. What kind of group of like clearly talent development professionals. You all know these answers so well. We're going to go into some depth around both of these so far. Yeah, not knowing your audience. And if you try to use a generic one size fits all cookie cutter approach to different audiences, you will crash and burn. Yes, people forget the purpose of communication is to be understood. That is exactly what it is. Communicate. We don't communicate for communication's sake. I'll just give you an example of this. If the goal of communication is to be understood, that just prompted something. So I was working with the head of a marketing group. Um, so I'm, she was the head of marketing for a mid-sized pharmaceutical company. And she was doing the marketing strategic review for the upcoming year for the rest of the team, the rest of the executive team. And I was there to coach a bunch of people and the team itself. And so on a break, I asked this woman, her name happened to be Jackie. I said, Jackie, so tell me, how do you think it's going so far with the marketing presentation? She said, excellent. I said, well, how do you decide excellent? She said, oh, well, you know, we still have 20 minutes left and I've only got two slides to go. That was her litmus test for how it was going. No sense of, are they engaging in the content, the material? For her, it was again, communication for, I have to get through this. Have you ever said that yourself or come on, folks, stay with me. We only have a few slides left. You know, what are we saying when we say things like that? What we're saying is, you know, you don't call me out on stuff. I don't call you on stuff. We'll check the box. We'll go back and nothing much will change. So what else do we have up here? Yes, yeah, same words carry different messages to each people, poor listening skills, not checking for clarity, not considering the recipient. Oh, these are great. Not remembering that others may not be as expert as you. Often they are not. And one of the challenges that we have, I call it the curse of subject matter expertise. Compared to your audience, you are probably an expert. And the challenge, of course, is let's say you have 27 things you could share with someone. 27 things is going to overwhelm them. So how do you pick the top three of your 27? And maybe it's number four, number 17, and number 26 that turn to be the best three to illustrate what they need at this point. Unfortunately, too many people's subtext in communication is, I want to impress you with how knowledgeable and expert I am which all you're doing is confusing people. So recognizing that. Yeah, so lots of great answers here to this question. Why it's, the fact is, and someone said bias says, yes, the fact is our brains are wired for miscommunication. In fact, misunderstanding and misunderstanding is the default setting for human co communication. That's why it is much easier said than done. And we have, as some of you said, biases, all these different cognitive biases, which create communication pitfalls that many of us fall into, some of us more frequently than others. And yet, even me, I am not immune to this. And you think, as my wife reminds me, Alain, you teach communication skills, shouldn't you be better at this by now? Ooh, ah, ooh. Anyway, you get the idea. But I wanna tell you a story, uh, happened recently actually, of one I fell head over heels into one of the very, in fact, probably the most common communication pitfall. So for this story, I have a little visual for you, it's not, it gives you a good picture, which has two cars. Let me explain. So my house in Northampton, Massachusetts happens to have no garage, like this picture has a garage, but it has two cars. We have a two car family and our house has a driveway next to the house, which is narrow enough. Only one car can go all the way to the end of the house, except at the end, the driveway opens up and it widens where you can park two cars side to side, like you see on the screen. Now we are a two car family, which means that when people come to visit us, they park their car 
in the driveway behind our cars, which effectively blocks us in, which really is not a big deal. All we do is do a little car juggling. One person moves and then we get out and that's fine. So recently, our friends, Pam and Charlie, who live in Washington, D.C., drove to visit us. I live in Northampton, Massachusetts, a couple hours west of Boston. And they drove. We had a wonderful weekend. They drove up and they parked their car behind our cars. Now, this is now Sunday morning. And I had to leave to go to the airport to fly to give a keynote speech the next day for a client. So I said to Pam, because they were leaving in the afternoon, I said, Pam, I got to go to the airport in a few minutes. Would you mind please moving your car out? And she said, great. Where do you want me to park the car? I said, can you just go ahead and park your car out in front of the house? Like I'd tell anybody that. She said, you sure? I said, yeah. I said, you want me to park my car in front of the house? I said, yeah. All right. And then there was this pause. And again, there's only four of us in the room at the time. But then suddenly Pam started talking, kind of declaiming really loudly as though there's 40 people in the room. She said, all right, then I'll park my car in front of the house. And I just kind of thought, what's up with Pam? That was a bit strange, but I didn't think anything of it because I'm rushed. I'm going to the airport. So I get my suitcase and I get my laptop bag and I go to my car and I put my stuff in the trunk, close the trunk. I get into the driver's side, I turn on the ignition key. And then I put the car in reverse and I check my rear view mirror, I check my driver's side view mirror. I check my passenger side and I start slowly backing out in reverse and I'm checking my mirrors and then I turn my head around and something, this the strangest thing just catches my eye in this weird moment. And I, I swivel my head and I look, what, what, what is that? You know what it is? It's Pam's car. And do you know where Pam has parked her car? In front of the house, as in directly in front of the house, as in on the flower beds, directly adjoining, abutting the house. She has parked there. And all I could think was, Pam, when I say park your car in front of the house, what I mean is park your car on the curb on the street in front of the house where anyone would double park a car. Well, anyone except you, I guess, because you didn't do that. And that, in that moment, I realized, oh, that's why Pam asked me that question three times. And I kept saying the same thing because I was dealing with what psychologists would call the projection bias, which is where you unconsciously assume that other people have the exact same thoughts going through their head as you do, right? We've all been there, right? Like, oh, it's so obvious. And why do we suffer from the projection bias? Because the meaning has nowhere to go. It's clear in my head because it's already in my brain. It's like I'm playing the game of telephone with myself. Of course, I'm going to be 100% right. So that's my story with Pam and Charlie. However, when it comes to the projection bias, it rears its ugly head at work all the time. And you would hear it when people say things like, well, why don't they understand that this is a stupid process? Or maybe you've said things like, well, I sent the email. They should know what to do. Right? Have you ever said that? I know I certainly have. Or how come they don't realize that anytime you start a sentence with one of these things, please stop, because that is the projection bias that has just reared its ugly head. And you need to basically let go of your office romance with incredulity. The fact is, we all do this from time to time, and we can get very incredulous and self-righteous of like, don't they see? How can-? No, they don't, because they're not you. you know. And again, if we assume some positive intent and assume the fact that no one else is living in our head, No one else, just like you don't wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to make someone else's life really confusing and challenging by communicating poorly. You don't say that. No one else says that either. But that is a very, very real issue. So given that that's a real issue, let's talk about a simple, super simple and very streamlined solution to dealing with it. And I call the solution asking for a receipt. Now let's step back for a minute and talk about receipts. What exactly are receipts? Well, receipts are in fact proof of a complete transaction. And in life, the more important the transaction, the greater the likelihood you will ask for a receipt. So for example, let's say you go to the local convenience store, the 7-Eleven, et cetera. You buy a 79 cent pack of gum. They said, you want a receipt? Like, no, I'm good. I'm fine. Whatever. I mean, you want it, you don't, you don't need it. I can guarantee you there's not a single person on this call who has bought a house or bought a car and did not get a receipt, right? Because the stakes are high. You want proof of that transaction for whatever it is. And so if you think about in communication, asking for a receipt is a way for you to make sure that your information has not just been received, but you're confirming that it has in fact been understood. And there's a great example of asking for a receipt that actually comes from the fast food industry. Now I'm old enough, and some of you might be old enough to remember when they started putting drive-throughs in all the fast food restaurants, it was the early 1980s. And in case anyone hasn't had dinner yet, I apologize in advance. So yeah, so in the fast food industry, When they first put drive-throughs in, it was a nightmare. It was very common. Customer would drive up to the intercom. They'd place their order. They'd go up to the window to pick up their food. 
and it would be filled with mistakes. And this was consistent for months and months across, didn't matter which chain you were part of, this was consistent across the industry. Then a bunch of months later, the drive-through mistake rates just started plummeting across the board. You might be wondering, what technology did they introduce? How did they change that? So suddenly it got much better. The fix was so simple. What they started doing was having the employees repeat the order back to the customer. So let's say it's McDonald's. And I'm not playing favorites, just one that everyone knows. So let's say the customer came up and said, I'd like to get two Big Macs, two medium fries, and two medium Cokes. Now, what the person taking the order would say, all right, that was two Big Macs, two medium fries, and two medium Cokes. Is that right? Yes, yes, boom. And guess what? You have confirmation of a completed transaction. Now, later on, they added new technology. They added in visual display, so you cannot just hear it, but see it. Today, obviously, you can go to a kiosk and just touch screen yourself and place your own order, all that stuff. So, but all of this is around confirming proof of a completed transaction. Now, again, think about the meetings that you have. I think about the meetings that I've been a part of and how many of them we're discussing some really good ideas. We might even get to some action steps and then, okay, we're out of time. Everyone's clear what we're doing, right? Yes, we're clear. And we all leave. And then you know what happens next, right? The meeting after the meeting, right? Where are you like, um, Maria, what, what do we just do, do, do agree to? Uh, so Maria and I have our own version of this, whereas like, let's say Scott and Susan, they have their own. So you've got 18 different pairs of people walking out of a 40 person meeting with 18 different versions of what we're all doing. And we wonder why we're not aligned. You know, what would the benefit be if you could not just, again, I know that sometimes you do this, but it's a question of what great leaders do is they do these things, these habits consistently. What if you consistently, as part of your meeting hygiene, ended your meetings a few minutes earlier to make sure that we did an understanding check and ask for a receipt. Or let's just go around and let's just confirm what is everyone walking away and what are the next steps? How much time and effort might that save? Again, look, if Taco Bell will invest in this technology over a 99 cent taco, don't you think that the work and the projects you are working on are worth the same level of clarity? So it's asking for a receipt. So that's the tool, super simple. What I'm gonna invite you to do is to put into the chat is just to do a little reflection for yourself, thinking of this tool, um, where could you use the ask for a receipt tool on a regular basis? Go ahead and put your answers in the chat. We can all learn from each other on this. Yeah, after meetings, thank you, Elizabeth. Probably any and all meetings for sure. And maybe some people are thinking even more specifically about certain meetings that they could be doing it. Yep. After talking with my husband, wife, clearly I've hit a nerve here around this, right? Honey, do, honey, I thought we agreed to, yeah, I tell me about it. Anyway, this is not a relationship course today, but yeah, you get the idea. In training sessions, of course, yeah, being really clear on making sure, because one of the things that we tend to shy away from this, I think part of it is the ego thing, right? It's like, hey, well, look, we're all a bunch of adults. We're professionals. We're executives. We're leaders. We kind of want to don't want to call each other out on that stuff. Frankly, it's not calling each other out. It is support. Yes, thank you. Anywhere and yes, definitely with my husband. Yeah, giving directions. Great, super to make sure that they are clear. Otherwise, like, yeah, I got this. I'm writing this down. Okay, so thank you for that. So that covers our tools. We've covered two so far: connection. We looked at listening with purpose communication. We've looked at asking for a receipt. Now we're going to move on to collaboration. Now there's a lot of different pieces to collaboration that we could focus on. Um, the fact is when it comes to collaboration, what we want to do as leaders is create an environment where people can be at their best. And again, I used the word earlier, engagement, right? When people are fully engaged, then they are able to operate at their best. And that would be a high performing collaborative environment. And I'm sure you know the research, this comes from Gallup, is that globally 85% of employees in the workforce are not engaged. So again, collaboration, engagement, easier said than done. And one of the things around collaboration, one of the pieces of that has to do with how are people motivated? Now, there is a wonderful story about motivation that comes back from the famous film director, Alfred Hitchcock. Maybe you've heard of Alfred Hitchcock. He was a famous director in the 1950s, 60s, into the 70s. And um, so Hitchcock was known very well known. He had a reputation for having a particular disdain for actors. He really didn't like actors. Basically, he saw the script and the story being the main point of a movie, and actors were supposed to be just putty in the director's hands to be molded the way the director saw. In fact, at one point, he was asked in an interview by a reporter, he said, Mr. Hitchcock, is it true that you said that actors are like cattle? And his response was, 
I never said actors are like cattle. What I said was actors should be treated like cattle. Right? So that's what he said. So famous story about Hitchcock. So he was making a movie. It's, it's out there. It's in the 1960s, 1964. Made a movie called Torn Curtain. The leading actor in the movie was Paul Newman. I hope you know Paul Newman, right? Best, best actor, Academy Award winning movie star. Now at the time, Newman was already a movie star. He had been nominated for the Academy Award twice. And so he was a high echelon actor. And Newman was known for something called method acting, right? And so he was trying to understand his character's motivation. So he came to Hitchcock as he's going through the script and he's saying, you know, Mr. Hitchcock, I need to ask you something here. I just don't understand my character's motivation in these couple of scenes. You, you got to help me out with this. And Hitchcock, again, doesn't want to be bothered with that. He said, look, everything you need to know is in the script. So Newman went away and he looked some more, but he still wasn't satisfied. So he came back and he said, this isn't helping. I need to know what is my character's motivation. So Hitchcock's reply famously was, Mr. Newman, your motivation is your salary. So realizing that, you know, Hitchcock, like, which I think mirrors a lot of leaders is like your motivation, your paycheck. We pay you. That's why you come to work. So just shut up and do it. Again, very old industrial age, Frederick Winslow Taylor kind of thinking. So the clearly Hitchcock, you know, and some leaders think like money motivates me. It must motivate other people. Therefore, that's what's the lowest piece of hanging fruit. And the problem with that is it's, you could even call it the golden rule, right? Hey, money works for me. Treat other people the way I like to be treated. That works. However, it doesn't work because people aren't you. Kind of goes back to commu communication, right? The reason that it isn't clear understanding is because people aren't you. And the reason that motivation doesn't work in the same way is because people aren't you. And therefore, the golden rule, as good as it sounds, I mean, again, the golden rule, it isn't necessarily good enough. Now, it turns out there's something that might be even better than the golden rule. And there's a wonderful story that comes from Dale Carnegie in his classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And what Carnegie writes there, he writes a story in which he says, I am personally very fond of strawberries and cream, but I find that fish prefer worms. So when I go fishing, I don't think to bait the hook with strawberries and cream, but instead I bait the hook with a nice juicy worm. And I say to the fish, wouldn't you rather have that? So what Carnegie is playfully describing in that is what has now come to be known as the platinum rule. Now, if the golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, the platinum rule is around do unto others as they would like to have done unto them. In other words, you need to find out what makes them tick in order to help them to tick better. And the only way you do that, going back to what Alicia said earlier, is you got to know your people. You got to know what is going to motivate them, what's not going to motivate them, what's going to work well, what's not going to work well. So these are things. That's why collaboration ultimately connects back to connection and communication. So again, you may be familiar with the platinum rule, but it is so valuable when you think about engaging people. So my question for you, and again, if you can put your answers into the chat for this, how can you use the platinum rule to better engage the people that you lead? You can go ahead and put your answers into the chat. I'd love to get some thoughts on this one. How can you use the platinum rule to better engage the people around you? Put your answers in the chat. Let's see what you got. Great. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Asking people what motivates them, making it meaningful and relevant. Sure. Learning about your team. Because again, when you know, it's amazing. Some people are familiar with a, very, a book that's been out for years now by Gary Chapman, right? The Five Love Languages. Speaking of relationships, right? What makes people tick? And that different people, like they talk about acts of service, mean one thing to some people, that's their love language versus gifts. It might be something else or quality time. Exactly, all these things. So asking people directly how you can help them. I love that comment there, Maria, because the fact is, like I said at the beginning, we're not mind readers. Why should you guess at this when you can ask people, hey, what would make this more engaging for you? This is the great age of leadership as we are now off the pedestal. It isn't about us being superheroes with a cape, having all the answers. It's more about having this facilitative mindset in asking people questions, listening with purpose, and then responding appropriately to get where they are. So great. Thank you for that. So we've covered three tools. We've looked at connection, listening with purpose. We looked at communication, asking for a receipt. We look at collaboration using the platinum rule. And when you start to embrace this facilitative mindset, the leadership lessons will start showing up in the most surprising and amazing of places, including 
the dentist's chair. So I actually got this wonderful leadership lesson from my dental hygienist recently. Her name is also Jackie. And Jackie is a da Vinci with a dental pick. I mean, for her, like every tooth is this blank canvas and she is an expert. In fact, the reason I go to this dentist isn't for the dentist, it's for Jackie because she is the best dental hygienist I've ever had in my entire life. So one day I'm getting my teeth cleaned by Jackie and I'm in the chair and during a break so I could talk, I said, Jackie, I've got to ask you this because you are the dental professional. There are all these toothbrushes on the market. I mean, there is just a glut. There's sonic power toothbrushes. There's battery operated toothbrushes. There's free floating bristle head toothbrushes. And that's just getting started. Jackie, tell me, what is the best toothbrush in the market? Which toothbrush should I be using? She stopped and I could see a little smile from the corner of her surgical mask. And I, you know, she had her protective goggles on and she went, the best toothbrush? Well, that's an easy one. It's the one you use twice a day. Right? So the fact is, if you want to be a better leader, you need to do what better leaders do. And the key to all this is consistency. I imagine that everything that I share with you today most of it's fairly intuitive and common sense, but what separates out the lousy from the mediocre to the average, to the good, to the great, to the amazing leaders isn't a question of knowing, it's a question of consistent practice. It's about building rituals and habits so you start doing these things more often. So if you want to be a better connector, you can listen with purpose. If you want to be a better communicator, ask for a receipt. If you want to be a better collaborator, you can use the platinum rule. Frankly, it doesn't matter which tool you use first. Like Jackie said, it's the one you use twice a day. It's make sure you get started and take action because ultimately this is just a bunch of ideas like, oh, well, you went to this webinar. That's great. We learned about these three C's. It's cute. They rhyme. They all start with C, connection, communication, collaboration. That's great. However, if you start to really apply them, magic can happen. Like I want to tell you what happened to these two women named Joanne and Emma. So Joanne was worked for a large um, department store chain. And she was at the time, this is earlier in her career, she ran a cosmetics counter for the department store. And she told me about Emma. This was early in her career. And one of her employees who worked the makeup counter was a young woman named Emma. Emma was probably about 18 at the time, she said. And Emma was a wonderful employee. She did wonderful jobs of makeovers for the client. She was really good with her customer service, but there was this issue. And as you can imagine, in cosmetics, appearance means a lot. And so they had a strict company policy about cleanliness of uniforms. And what would happen is when Emma would show up for her shift on Fridays, her uniform was consistently dirty. And so Joanne gave her a verbal warning, but nothing changed. She gave her a second verbal warning, nothing changed. She gave her a written warning, nothing changed over the course of weeks. And Joanne felt she was at her wit's end. She had nothing to do, but she had to let Emma go. So she asked Emma to meet her in the small supply closet with stacked high with cardboard boxes that happened to double as her office since they were pretty much on the floor all day long. And Joanna des described the day that she met Emma and was going to tell her that it was her last day at work. So she asked her to sit down. And as they sat in this very cramped supply office, Joanne looked across the table and as she was thinking about what she was going to say, she looked in Emma's eyes and she just got the sense that Emma was kind of strong-willed and stubborn and there was something else going on that Emma wasn't telling her. And so she just shifted. She shifted into trying to connect and trying to listen with purpose. And she said, the next conversation is by far the best leadership conversation I have ever had. So what she found after a lot of probing and connecting and patience and listening, what she found was that Emma had actually been living on her own since the time that she was 14 and her younger brother was 11. Her parents basically abandoned the two of them. And Emma was raising herself and her younger brother together. They were living in a small room where they had no stove. And basically she was doing three different jobs to try to make ends meet. And there was physically no way she could wash a uniform before her Friday shift, but she had too much pride to say anything to Joanne. And so here's Joanne thinking, I've got this lazy employee on my hands. And she realized, oh my gosh, nothing could be further from the truth. So she said, Emma, Emma, oh my gosh, I didn't realize this. Can I give you a couple of extra uniforms to tide you over so you can wash them with longer increments between? She said, that would be great. She said, they were both crying that day. But here's the kicker of that story. So that, that, that I just told you, that happened about 15 years ago. Since then, Joanne's been promoted. She's now the VP of merchandising for the entire department chain. But the best part of the story is that Emma is now the general manager of their flagship store. So connection, communication, collaboration, 
when we start applying it, as you all know, being a leader is a great, great opportunity and a great responsibility. But we shape people's lives. Think about the best leaders in your life and how they have influenced you. I think back to people like Joanne and Emma. And my hope is that with the tools of being better connectors, better communicators, and better collaborators, you can have that kind of impact on others. Fact is, I talked about this idea of the facilitative mindset. So the word facilitate comes from, or facilitative comes from the French or the Latin facile, which you know means easy. Fact is, and I don't, you don't need me to tell you this, but you know that we live in incredibly complex times. The world is certainly volatile and uncertain and ambiguous. And what people are looking to, they're looking for leaders who can make the complex a little bit more simple. They're looking for people who believe in the mission and purpose of an organization. They want leaders who can connect with empathy, who can communicate with clarity, who can collaborate creatively. Leaders with this 21st century facilitative mindset. Now, in theory, all this stuff is simple. The real challenge, the real challenge for each and every one of us is to live it. So thank you. A couple of things before I turn it back over to um, over here. Um, one is I created a summary for you um, for some of the slides, uh, PDF summary. And if you want to go ahead and download that, uh, I put a web page together. It's basically my website, alanhunkins.com forward slash ATD CFL. And you can download a P PDF summary of that. And also uh, while you're there, you'll have to put in your name and your email that will sign you up. I put out a monthly building strong leaders newsletter that has curated content. You'll be signed up to that. The first time it comes, if you don't want to keep getting it, just go ahead and unsubscribe. So I just want to let you know that is there. And the other thing that I like to do, um, and this is a surprise to Rosa as well, is if you go to my website, there is a spot where I offer a 30-day leadership challenge. I do an open challenge two or three times a year where basically we use an app and it uses micro learning, gamification, habit formation, and positive psychology to help people to become better connectors, better communicators, and better collaborators. And people engage in it. We've run about 20 of these cohorts so far over the last three years. It's really an amazing community and cohort. And for being here today, and we can extend this to those that are watching this as well, if you go to the website and you go to the webpage that is 30 Day Leadership Challenge, um, and it, you click on it, go down register now, ordinarily it is $397 per person. However, I'd like to offer you a complimentary two seats per person. You can bring a guest from your organization if you want. Ideally, someone who is in the talent development space. Obviously, do I have a certain agenda? Yes, I would love for you to have a wonderful experience and go through this. And if you find, wow, this is really great, I could see there being some value in my organization, then we can have a conversation on the back end. But in the meantime, I would hope that you would just have a wonderful experience to help you develop your own personal and professional leadership. And again, you need to use the coupon code CHALLENGE100 when you get to the kind of the payment field, you put in CHALLENGE100 to the coupon code, it will gray out all the credit card information. And also, if you have any questions beyond here, I know we have a few minutes for questions here, so I'll stop sharing my screen in a moment. But if you want to reach out to me, any questions that came up, I'm going to give you my direct email. And maybe, Rose, if you can put this in the chat, it is my first name, Alain, A-L-A-I-N, at alainhunkins.com. Again, that's Alain, at alainhunkins.com. And yeah, clearly, I hope you can see that what I'm here to do is to help people to become leaders. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Scott and I were uh, in in the background, um, you know, chatting and he's like, by far best speaker all year. And I've got to say even possibly the, the previous year as well. So like, bravo. Thank you so much. And You're totally took us by surprise with this amazing gift for the yeah. people who joined and, and, you know, extending it to the ones that weren't able to make it. Thank you so oh, much for that. Well, it's my pleasure. And you know, as, as many of you know, this industry, it's unless your name is Simon Sinek or John Maxwell or Brene Brown, this is a word of mouth industry. You know, we have to support each other. So I want to support you in your work. And I just, I'm a big believer in karma. If you do good work and share it, that it comes back to you. And that's how Amen. my business model sure has been working. It sure does. That's right. Thanks. That's right. So um, we'll open the, the call to the folks on here to 
ask questions or, you know, uh, feedback on, on what you thought. Uh, I, I personally have two and a half pages of notes. I'm Great. excited and I, I'm trying to think of who's that leader I'm going to invite uh, to take uh, uh, take you up on that offer uh, with me. So uh, I'd love to hear from the folks on the call. Me too. I, I loved that, your presentation. I was impressed. I've seen a lot of leadership webinars and they all sound the same. The, um, the concept of asking for a receipt. Yes. I, I can relate to that. And for me, that's priceless. Awesome. Because so we keep talking about, oh, there should be action items after a meeting and somehow it isn't resonating yeah. but this makes sense and um wow just we've had miscommunication abounding everywhere and the fact that uh, you pointed out that we're practically wired to misunderstand each other is another great point you know yeah. and so i appreciate your taking the time like i said i wish i hadn't missed the very beginning but yeah uh, no worries. We can catch the video. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying about we are wired for this. And I think what we tend to do, and this is true in a lot of areas, and plus we're in a very individualist society in the U.S. So when it's not working, we think, oh, it must be me. It's a character defect. I'm flawed. I didn't do it. And then it, that brings up all the shame and the ego of like, oh, I should do this better. I, no, we all, we, I do this. We all do this. And I think if we can learn to maybe just have a little more compassion for it, and address the fact that this is an issue, then we can make some space to get better at it. And that's what it takes is that willingness to do that. So thanks. Yeah, you, you brought up a great point because we do tend to uh, then, you know, self blame and, you know, it's, it's, you know, I did this or I did that, or the flip side is then we're judging others, you know, well, you know, and, and thinking all kind of things about people instead of allowing some grace and, and really figuring out a different way to get the message across and also thinking, uh, how can we, uh, you know, say the same thing five different ways so that if the, there's 10 people in the audience, at least five of them will, will understand it. Being yeah. more inclusive in, in the words we're using and, and just in trying to connect with people. And, and I, I love what you said about that platinum rule. And, and it's true. It's not, how do I want um, treating others how I want to be treated. It's how yeah. do they want to be treated? Because what works for me may not work for someone else. Exactly. Right. And, and, and to that end, I mean, I know many people are struggling with this whole return to the office, right? That whole sense of what is that? And what I have, and I'm, I'm doing a lot of articles on this and interviewing a lot of people. And what we're seeing is that the people are doing this well, is that there's no one size fits all. Because mm -hmm. how can there be? Everyone wants a different thing and, mm -hmm. and letting and trying to, and what I find particularly cutting edge organizations are, they're basically empowering the teams to make decisions at the team level of what's going to work for us. Because, and that, and then even within the team, there's some variation. So it goes back to what you're just saying here around this platinum rules. Like we can't, you know, what, why are you saying, you know, <laughs> I was joking with the CEO, I said, you know, it'd be funny. Like what, what we should say is, you know, because what we're, they're giving all these excuses, like we need you back in the office because we're missing the creativity and the brainstorming that happens at the water cooler. There is no research that supports any of that stuff. No, no. I think it, it would be way more honest to say, you know what? I want you back in the office because frankly, I have high control needs and I feel better. Like that's honest. Say that. Just, it's true. Then say it. But don't give us a bunch of malarkey about the fact that we should be here somewhere else. So. Alan, thank you so much. It was an amazing presentation. I, I am really thrilled to see, love the organization and the structure of that. Uh, thank you tool that you mentioned about um, how to connect, communicate, and then find the collaboration, right? right? Because everything starts on that willingness to connect. If yeah. we don't start there, you can try many communication, but of course we have to start there. Yeah. Really willing to, to connect with people. Exactly. So it was Great. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you like the structure. And by the way, and I'll just say, Maria, if you like the structure of this presentation and the kind of the logic and the design, you'll love the book, right? The book's back there. Because the book is, and again, my background, I'm a practitioner. I hope that comes across. I'm a practitioner. Yes. I'm not an author who sat here in a closet. Like, this is what I think about leadership. This all came out of working with teams and groups and organizations like yours over the course of 20 years and seeing patterns. And, and I just started taking notes. And I remember I was we were talking about this when we met in person. Um, the fact is, 
this work, I was like, how can I express this in a way that people who, you don't want theory, we don't need more leadership theory, we need practice, we need to be able to do this stuff. So yeah, if you like this structure, please check out the book. I, I, and if you don't like it, I will. I'll, I'll be surprised. <laughs> it, it, yes, it really does. It's it. lots of lots of stories. It's very easily, you know, as one of my friends said, I hate business books. They put me to sleep and I actually stayed awake for yours. So I take that as high praise. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, but listen, it's amazing because um, you are giving us a lot of, you are nurturing our needs for information and for insight about the leadership that we have. And um, as you said at the beginning, we always have that room for improvement on what we are doing. And yes. this is great tools. Thank great. you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for anyone? It was awesome. Thank you. You're most welcome, Scott. Thank you. My pleasure. Can you give a can you give a little bit more info, information about the leadership challenge? Sure, uh, a little bit more. So what's good is if you go to the website, there's actually a video that walks you through the platform. It actually has a okay. demo. It's like a Loom and tutorial video that'll walk you through everything. But basically, what it is, it's an app. It's an app based program that you log in. So it's it's asynchronous. So the idea is that you're spending an average of five minutes a day. Now it runs for thirty consecutive days. But you can only earn points because it's gamified. You can only earn points five of the seven days because we don't want people to feel like they have to be on all the time. But you actually get benefits just a few days a week. You'll get benefits of it. And so the way it works is that you log in and it's basically around becoming intentional. So there's a format and a structure that becomes ritualized and a habit of like, so every day, for example, there's an inspirational quote. And all you have to do is read it and you click, you get 10 points because everything is game. Every action is gamified. If you don't like Duolingo or any other app, mm -hmm. there's so many things that are gamified. So you got that, and then you set an intention. So how do I want to show up and be an intentional either, and you drop down connector or communicator or collaborator. And let's say, for example, it's like, oh, I'm going to be meeting with Rosa today. I could like, I'm going to connect with Rosa. How do I want to? And so the idea is to prime your day for intention. So all that part is private, but later on you also, we have a celebrating win section. So you can celebrate your wins in the public cohort. And it's like social media. People can high five you and like it, and they can also write comments back and forth. So you're supported and also because people are doing this, they're sharing personal wins, they're sharing professional wins. And for me, so many of us think of learning and leadership as this individual thing. It's like, what do we learn this in community and actually seeing other people share their struggles? It's incredibly nurturing and supportive. So people have found it's been really helpful for their sense of community and connection. We also have a gratitude feature where it's like, what's one thing you're grateful for today? In addition, we have micro lessons where three times a week, I call them coaches corners, basically a 90 second or less video drop. Like here, watch this. And then how can you apply this in your course of your day? So it's got that. And then once a week, we have a weekly challenge that is basically like a TED talk, TEDx talk, like 12 minutes or less. And it's all curated. Each week is a theme. So the first week is context. The second week is connection. The third week is communication. And the last week is collaboration. We do a live kickoff and we do a live graduation on Zoom. If you can't make them, we understand because we got people from literally around the world. So sometimes like it's three in the morning, can't help you. We Or I'm busy. I just got stuff. We record them so you can catch that up. And I'm also, we also have master classes where I invite a bunch of colleagues. It's like a live podcast where I interview someone who is a subject matter expert, whether it's around diversity, equity, and inclusion, or coaching, or a best-selling author and stuff. So I have a great network. And so I've been having these wonderful master classes. And it's also a way to meet people from outside. And again, it's another networking opportunity. Uh -huh. So I love them. I mean, I started doing them in the pandemic kind of out of necessity because I couldn't travel and work. And I've just, they have become so much fun. And we do three open ones a year. We also do these intact with closed groups for, I have a number of clients that do these internally with as a part of their management, ongoing management development program for their internal people, either with frontline leaders or mid-level leaders, depends on the organization. Thank you. Yeah, Thank sure. You. Of course, Alicia. Well, uh, you will definitely be hearing from me. Um, I'm going to take you up on that offer, but I'm uh, already on the page to set up a separate one-on-one uh, -on -one chat. I'd love to learn more about what you can possibly do for the leaders in our organization. Uh, that is one thing I'm trying to uh, continue to, to grow is that leadership development sure. Uh you know, in different experiences for them. We have about 40 uh, people, leaders, and another group of about maybe 25 up and coming people mm -hmm. who are really amazing and who I, I think would be great people leaders. And so I think 
they all need your book and they all need a little bit of uh, interacting with you and learning how to be better, better leaders. Happy to support in any way I can. Yeah, if anyone, the floor is open. I'm happy to meet with anyone just around anything I can do to be of support. This is what gets me up out of bed in the morning and keeps me up late at night. So I'm excited for it. I feel really lucky. Again, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you all. And so for all of you on the call, thank you so much for participating today. On the screen, you see the things we've got coming up in the next few uh, weeks. Actually, next week, a session with a uh, panel of speakers. So if you're interested in uh, possibly speaking at conferences, uh, then join us for that. We've got uh, some folks who run conferences from the Learning Guild uh, joining us on that panel and people who have uh, spoken at conferences, uh, some big names like Myra Roldan and Ron Price and a few others. So uh, seats are filling up fast. So I uh, hope to see some of you there. Then this year, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with our ATD uh, Central Florida Wild uh, event, which is our annual uh, member event. Well, this year we're taking a road trip and we're going to Jacksonville and we're going to visit our sister chapter there. And we're going to go wild for one day in Jacksonville uh, on November 4th. So we hope to see some of you there. And uh, then Keith Keating is coming back to talk to us November 16th. And we've got a tentative date for a holiday networking event. We uh, still don't have a location. So save the date. We're trying to figure out where we're going. We want to be in person again. Have you have some drinks and happy tizers with us. And uh, Scott and I and Maria and the rest of the board are trying to find a great place where we can go uh, meet and mingle and just have some good old fun like we were doing pre-pandemic. And uh, already mentioned, you know, we're looking for volunteers. So if you're interested, uh, give us a shout, you know, email us, uh, contact us via uh, uh, any of our social channels or Slack. If you're with us on Slack, we uh, love uh, people to come and join us and learn with us. Uh, you don't necessarily have to know anything about running a board. Uh, there are so many things where you can lend a hand, like today, facilitating a webinar uh, for a speaker. That is a task, right? And if you've never done it before, we can show you how to do it. And then you, that's something you can add to a resume. So many different ways that you can help us uh, continue chapter operations. And uh, we thank you for being a member and for joining us today. And most importantly, Elon, thank you. From uh, me, the board and members, thank you for your time, your insight, and for being willing to share your ideas. You're most welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Rosa, for doing all the arrangement for this presentation. It oh, it was that was divine intervention that had him stop at our booth at the training magazine. <laughs> yep, it was meant to be. Yeah, we are glad to. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.